Alright, today is Tuesday, November 8th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. Happy Elections Day. Hope you're done with the voting. Whoever clown you voted for, it doesn't matter to me. And frankly, it's not going to matter to you because nothing is going to change. But maybe the stock market is going to go up. So far, the futures are happy. We'll see what happens by the end of the night when it's all said and done. But let's start by this. Yesterday was the drawing date for the Powerball $2 billion lottery. And unfortunately, there was a glitch. It was a technical issue and they could not do the drawing. The balls uh, would not fall for some reason. They got clogged. And about a day later, we got the results and somebody in California won. And rumor has it it's uh, the government. The government won the lottery. Whoops. Folks, did we say we're going to give you $2 billion? Joke's on you because uh, an anonymous government official won the $2 billion lottery. And he, she shall remain an anonymous for as long as possible. Even the damn lottery is rigged in this country. And I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, hey, Maverick, are you a lottery results denier? You don't believe in our institution of lottery? Are you spreading misinformation? I say, calm down. I believe the lottery. Whatever the results are. I'm just mad because I want them to do a redrawing. I think I'll have a better chance next time. But anyhow, let's talk about the market because this is what the channel is all about after all. And today we got interesting action. The market was amidst the uh, midterms optimism, rallying higher and higher and higher. But then came uh, some funny activities in the tulip market, aka the crypto market. Let's say a crash and the stock market went down right away. It was a flush down until the plunge protection team intervened. We gotta keep these stocks higher until the um, uh, the elections are done. And then we deliver the bags when nobody cares anymore. And by the way, the elections are going on right now as I'm speaking, but by the time you get the video, it's gonna be over. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see what happens. We're going to talk about what happened in the crypto market, of course. But before we do that, I'd like to start with a segment we call Word on the Street. And in this segment, we talk about what the analysts and the strategists and the experts and the smarty pants think about the stock market. And let's begin with the bullish calls. And here's uh, Tom Lee, your favorite analyst once again. And Mr. Lee says stocks could snap their ugly downtrend by year end. And bearish investors are unrealistic for thinking fundamentals will not change. Tam Lee also adds and says a pause in the Fed's interest rate hikes would drive a massive allocation shift to stocks. <laughs> and then we have the folks from Oppenheimer and they say the S&P 500 could rally 10% through year end with positive earnings surprises among catalysts. Um, did you see the earnings? Anyways, here comes the Santa optimism. Charles Schwab says the Fed and other central banks could deliver a Santa pause rally for stocks globally this year as they dial back the size of freight hikes, again with the same stupidity. When the Fed chairman came out and said, hey, it doesn't matter what the size is, we're going higher, baby, it's going to go higher and higher and higher. But it doesn't matter. They want to rally stocks using any excuse, anything. It doesn't matter. Just get us some rally, damn it, so we can score some uh, bonuses before year end. And here's Bank of America saying the stock market just passed a big test in determining whether its secular bull run will continue. But risks remain. Oh, really? And by the way, the test is the 200 weeks moving average, which remains intact at least for now in the S&P 500. Now let's talk about the bearish calls. And we have uh, Mr. Demon from JP Landromat, and he says stocks could fall another easy 20%. And the next drop will be much more painful than the first. And then we got Douchebank, who says uh, investors are seriously underpricing the risk of a 70s style stagflation, and markets could be in for a long period of negative returns for stocks and bonds. We also have from interactive brokers Thomas Petterfee, who sees the SP 500 dropping nearly 20% from here. And then we have some analysts who says uh, history tells us that the S&P 500 is only two-thirds of the way through the current bear market. Goldman Sachs says this is not the bottom for stocks and a recession is not priced in. And Stiefel says a lost decade in the stock market is likely as long as oil prices continue to trend higher. UBS says the S&P 500 could plunge another 16% and would not bottom until the Fed starts to cut interest rates. 
big number. Which means what, 2025? Ned Davis says the Fed's path to a soft landing of the economy is a fanciful magic carpet ride, as its inflation fight is a lose-lose scenario. And then we have uh, Mike Wilson from Morgan Stanley. A uh, Mike, you know, he comes every year and says, oh, the stock market is going to go down 10% in a correction. But rest assured, it's going to recover at some point. It's only 10% and then we go higher again. And guess what? The market keeps going higher and higher and higher. And then at some point it goes down 10% and everybody comes out and says, Oh, Mike Wilson is a prophet. But this kind of market is a Mike Wilson kind of market because it keeps going down. It's not just 10%. It keeps, keeps going 20%, 30%. And Mike says the stock market could rally for another few months as upbeat earnings. What the hell are you talking about? Mask the pain to come in 2023. Um, have you looked at the earnings? And then here's the latest from Mike. He says the midterms elections can push the S&P 500 higher, but a surge in treasury yields could stall a rally. So what is he saying here? I should buy now and then wait for yields to go higher? And then I end up holding the bag. Is that what he's saying? I don't know. And I say, instead of this wishy-washy, oh, maybe this, maybe that, it could go up, it could go down. Yes, it's going to go up, but watch out for this. Yes, it's going to go down, but watch out for that. All of that bullshit, because everybody's afraid. But you know who's not afraid? It's Dr. Doom and Gloom, Rubini. And he warns that the S&P 500 could plunge another 30%, and the U.S. economy faces a long, painful recession. Boom. Straightforward. Down 30%, hold on to your diapers. Stay calm and continue to buy puts. And if you say, oh, but, but Dr. Rubini is a perma bear, he's doom and gloom. No, he's not. In his last forecast, it was down 40%. He said he expects a long, ugly recession and stocks sinking 40%. Now he's down to 30%. There you go. There's a bright side to everything here even in doom and gloom. And next, let's talk about a segment we call the Kabooming Economy. We choose truth over facts. And today in the morning, we got the small business index. The optimism is flushing down. I don't know, if this is a booming economy, small business optimism should be shooting higher, not melting down, as we've seen back in the Great Recession. But hey, nothing to see here, right? The economy is booming, small businesses are just uh, in the pockets of Putin. They're lying. And when we look at small businesses, credit conditions. Uh-oh. This is stalling and trending down. If small businesses cannot get access to loans, what do you think will happen? And let me fix this one for you. Here it is. Yep, this is exactly what's going to happen. So if you're going to have loan conditions diving down along with optimism, the headline reading of the index is down, yet prices and labor compensation remains sticky. They're still holding way above everything. This is yet another indication that we have severe stagflation in the economy. For now, since we don't have layoffs yet, but that's coming. The consumer is swiping those credit cards up and down, up and down, up and down, and this is stimulating inflation higher and higher and higher. And here's what's going to happen. The headline readings, such as business activities or business conditions, all of these readings will go down crashing, but the readings for inflation will stick. They might trend down, they might have already peaked, but it's going to take a lot of time for those to go down, and hence stagflation. And the moment the Fed says, okay, maybe business conditions are going down and prices are also going down, we should ease and pivot and say, okay, we're not going to uh, hike rates anymore. What do you think will happen? A rebound in inflation. And this is the main problem with this economy. And it seems that everybody now thinks, hey, this will be resolved amicably. Oh, really? You think so? It's going to be ugly. Throwing plates, slashing tires, pulling hairs, lawyers, you know the deal. But anyhow, let's talk about the main subject of this program. And here it is, in focus tonight. Tulip chaos. A crash in the tulip market almost spelled all the way to the stock market. And this is only the beginning of the financial risk we're about to see in the stock market. You see, yesterday we got some rumors, you know, misinformation, right? And these uh, misinformation said that Sam Bankman Freed, you should change his name to Sam Bankrupt Fried, was once admired as the king of crypto. You know why? Because he kept bailing out all of these exchanges that went bankrupt. He had the bank, he kept bankrolling all of these uh, tulip exchanges that went bust. But then we heard the rumors that he's about to go bust. And this guy did extensive research and uh, a long post explaining why FTX will face insolvency problems. And immediately SBF and FTX 
and SDDs came out and said, that, what, 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 what are you talking about here? There's nothing. These are rumors, they're misinformation, they're false rumors. Our balance sheet is beautiful. And if you suggest otherwise, we're going to remove you from social media. But guess what? Today we got the confirmation. Tulip Exchange Binance has reached an agreement to buy rival FTX with the terms undisclosed. And the terms are, please, I'm begging you, anything. I'll make cereal for you. I'll wash your car. I'll even go down and shine your shoes too. And immediately, a token for FTX called FTT, this is another tool that went down by 90% in a single day. And it went down all the way to zero. Fortune favors the brave. Yep. And we're going to see this happening all over the place. Not just in the tulip market, but also in the stock market. All of these zombie companies, they're going down to zero. I promise you. And speaking of zombie companies, how about Coinbase? The company was down today. Nobody could trade tulips. Lots of problems, outages, and of course, margin calls all over the place. And Coinbase says, hey, we have no attachment at all to the tulip that just blew up. FTT, we don't have that. But it didn't matter. The panic was here. The liquidation happened right away. And we saw immediately Bitcoin initially went higher and then it flushed down big time. And folks, this will have ripple impacts across the market. We're seeing financial risk right now. We are now at the stage of a financial accident. Maybe it's not going to be FTX. Or maybe it's going to be something else. But again, this is not a joke. You got all of these uh, tulip exchanges. In the last two years, we're spending billions and billions of dollars in ads, in expansion, in uh, renaming stadiums. And now all of these companies are blowing up. We're talking about companies with valuations of over a billion dollars. In the case of FTX, it was a $25 billion at some point. You think we're not going to have ripple impacts across the economy because of this? People losing their jobs in the crypto industry, the spending on chips, all of the margin calls and the liquidations that will come with it. For example, a lot of folks say Tesla's down today. What's the deal with Tesla? Is it Elon? Is it the recalls? Perhaps. But we also have a lot of folks, retail mom and pops, who are losing their shirts right now because they're investing in tulips. And all of a sudden, their investment is down 90% in a day, even in the more established ones. Ethereum, Bitcoin. We're getting massive down days, double digits. And what happens then? When you get the margin call, you have to liquidate your stock portfolio. A lot of these folks who buy Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other tulips happen to be the same people who also own Tesla. That's the piggy bank. That's the ATM. If they need cash, they sell Tesla, they sell Apple. So watch out for these names. That is another risk. Here's another one. All of these venture capitalists, the uh, angel investors who poured hundreds of millions of dollars to invest in FTX and other exchanges, now they're underwater. Now their investment is blowing up. You think this will pass with no consequences, with nobody getting scathed? Think again, buddy. We're just seeing the ripple impacts here. But the market, once again, ignores everything because the market is in the mode now to rally. They want to rally based on anything. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's not the pivot, it's the midterms. If it's not the midterms, it's all oh, the CPI. If it's not the CPI, it's the Santa rally. If it's not Santa, it's something else. It doesn't matter what it is. In the meantime, ignoring earnings that are absolutely abysmal. Ignoring the risk that the Fed is about to tighten more and push rates even higher than before. Ignoring the risk of a financial accident. Ignoring the recession risk. And the question becomes, what will it take for the market to wake up from these fantasies? Is it actually something blowing up? Because this will happen soon. If Bitcoin goes below 15,000 and it starts heading into the 10,000, territory. A lot of things will blow up. Individual accounts, certain companies will blow up, such as Block, PayPal, MicroStrategy, hedge funds, institutionals will also blow up because a lot of these investments took place based on margin. A lot of stupid risk taking in the last two years and now interest rates are moving higher. And on top of that, if the underlying value of these assets collapse, that would be another shoe. And I say, who's going to bail Binance? Right, if all of these tulip exchanges bailed each other out and now we're left with Binance, Coinbase, and FTX. Okay, FTX is falling apart. Next, Coinbase. And then what happens? Binance wins. It becomes the next Amazon. Or is Binance about to blow up too? And if that happens, who's going to bail out Binance? The Chinese government? The US government? Or are we going to sit with a big bag of popcorn and watch the fireworks? And folks, if you invested with these uh, four geniuses, your portfolio might be experiencing uh, excessive fireworks. And of course, the catch is all four of them will walk away rich as you know what. And who ends up holding the bag? The answer is you and me, baby.
the mom and pops. And of course, the sad story of all of this is uh, Mr. Sam Bankrupt Fried is not going to be able to um, pursue his uh, political ambitions. See, he wanted to be a power player, a kingmaker, based on the insane paper money he was sitting on. He intended to invest about $1 billion in manipulating elections. But unfortunately for Mr. Fried, it's not going to happen. The sixth largest donor is a Democrat. They're talking about the donors for these uh, midterms elections, who made arguably the biggest splash for his party this cycle. Samuel Bankman Freed, a 30 years old cryptocurrency billionaire. His 37 billion million billion gazillion dollars in giving helped fund the Democrats' two main super PACs, the Senate Majority Fund and the House Majority Fund, as well as the party's official House and Senate campaign arms. So he lost the business and now he lost the money he spent on all of these clowns who lost their seats anyways. But Mr. Backman Fried, biggest giving is at least $27 million went to protect our future PAC, ostensibly devoted to backing candidates who would champion pandemic protection. Hmm. It in turn sank more than $11 million on a failed Democratic primary candidate in Oregon, Carrick Flynn, as well as other primary efforts in solid Democratic districts. Wow. And unlike Republican mega donors, Mr. Backman Freed is also trying to maintain relations in both parties, giving at least $45,000 to the National Republican Congressional Committee and thousands more to Republican senators like Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, John John Boozman, Bosman of Arkansas, Susan Collins of Maine, and John Hovern of North Dakota. And let me guess here, all of them support tulips, right? But unfortunately for Mr. SPF, his political power is no longer here. His dreams of uh, spending $1 billion in manipulating elections, mm, not gonna happen anymore. He needs somebody to spend $1 billion to save his ass right now. What a turn in fortunes. Enjoy it while it lasts. That's the moral of the story here, folks. What goes up must come down. Because, you know, we got the law of gravity and all. Anyways, let's move on to the ele election elections. Let's move on to the stock market coverage, folks. I'm looking at the elections here. We're talking about the stock market here. And let's start with the closing of the indices today. And uh, here we go. The Dow Industrial Average in the green by 333.83 points or a gain of 1.02%. The Nasdaq also in the green by 51.68 points or a gain of 0.49%. The S&P closing positive by 21.31 points or a gain of 0.56%. When it comes to the sector's performances today, the dollar is down. No wonder why materials are up and leading the pack at number one, capturing the gold medal. At a number two for the silver, technology, number three for the bronze, industrials. Now, the decline of the dollar is favorable for materials, technology, but mostly chips, and it should be favorable for multinationals and industrials. We see names like Boeing shooting up higher, but it also should have been favorable for energy, yet energy came out lagging, closing last, because we have news out of the forecast from the EIA. We'll talk about that in the commodities coverage, but before we do that, here is the advanced to decline ratios, NYSE 59% advancing versus 39% declining. The NASDAQ 46% advancing versus 51% declining. And here it is, commodities, what's going on? Energy commodities down across the board, including the party boy natural gas, down a little over 10.5% for the day. But it also was an ugly day for crude, both the WTI and Brent down, WTI down by about 3.5%, Brent down by about 3%. Why did this happen? Here it is. Now we have the weather forecast. Oh, did we say that it's going to be cooler than average yesterday? Now it shows that it's going to be warmer than average. It's price manipulation. It doesn't matter what they say. But the EIA came out with the forecast, and they say that the price of natural gas will be down by January, downgrade of about 5.4% from the previous outlook. Yet they upgraded the outlook for diesel to be up by 8.4%. So... Diesel goes higher, natural gas goes down. This is what they're assuming, of course. And this is what they say. Because of higher than expected storage levels heading into winter, our forecast natural gas spot price at Henry Hub averages about 6 bucks per million BTU. And this is going to happen as soon as the fourth quarter of 22 and then the first quarter of 23. But the significance of this downgrade is the price is down by about 1 buck per million BTU. Now, here's the same people who said back in December of 21 that they see the price of natural gas at 3.98 bucks per million BTUs in 2022. And we all know that the price went as high as 10 bucks per million BTUs. So these people are the experts, of course. 
And then they gave us the forecast for the WTI crude. And they say it could go up, it could go down, or it could stay the same. There you go. And since we're talking about natural gas and oil and all of that, let's get you an update for uh, Sticker to Tapu and Bra. Sticker to Tapu and Bra. <laughs> <laughs> we know that the price cap on Russian oil is looming right now. But before that happens, Janet Yellen must sell the program. And the biggest problem here is India. If India continues to buy Russian oil and it doesn't join the program, it's not going to work out. So they sent the old lady Janet Yellen to India to whip the Indians into submission. And my guess is the Indians will say get lost, old lady. And the reason is... Sure, we're buying Russian oil, but so are the Europeans and the rest of Asia. Matter of fact, Russia's oil exports to Asia hit the highest so far this year, because time is running out before new sanctions kick in. So the sanctions in this case are counterproductive because all what happens is they front load the demand, and countries buy Russian oil ahead of the sanctions. The end result is Russia gets richer. Putin makes more money. And if you thought this was bad, here it is. And the headline reads, Russia's liquefied natural gas exports are near a record high, as the realities of harsh winter eat away at countries' promises to curb their dependence on Moscow. Whoops. And look at Putin, he's laughing. I get these donkeys. Russia's LNG exports rose 1.1% on a year to a record high of nearly 4.3 billion cubic meters in October. The EU is replacing piped Russian gas with imported LNG cargoes, which could pose a political risk. LNG shipments from Russia to the EU rose by 46% in the first nine months of 2022 from 2021. Hello. Europe has vowed to wean itself off uh, energy from Russia and aims to replace piped natural gas from the country with liquefied natural gas or LNG. By doing this, it can hamstring Russia's energy's coffers. As the war in Ukraine drags on, there is just one problem. Moscow is also a major exporter of LNG, meaning the EU might end up replacing piped Russian gas with imported Russian LNG cargoes. Ta-da! The very thing it was hoping to avoid. But hey, so long as you're sticking to Putin, right? And I know some of you, hey Maverick, uh, you, you're a puppet for Putin. I'm not a puppet for Putin. These people who are buying Russian LNG are the puppets for Putin. And we all know that they're secretly buying Russian LNG and natural gas from Turkey. All of a sudden, Turkey says, hey, we have a few uh, billion dollars in our account, but we cannot really disclose how they got there. And we know Turkey buys... Russian uh, natural gas, and they sell it back to Germany. And now the Turks are buying Russian gas in rubles. So there you go. Here's your uh, sticking at the Putin update. Now back to the futures. What about softs? Uh, we have sugar shooting up higher. We talked about that before on Twitter, that India is banning exports of sugar. That tightens the supply. Sugar shooting up higher. And we got a similar story with cocoa futures. The supply is down from Africa. Cocoa futures up again by about 1.5%. Then we have more modest gains for cotton, a little under or half a percentage point. Yet we have declines led by lumber, down a little over 3.25%. Likewise, OJ, down about 2.25%. And here it is, coffee futures down almost 3% for the day. Now, I entered a long trade for coffee, and the support was 170. The moment, Futures traded below 170. That's it. You got to get out of the trade because the support is no longer here. And now that I'm out of the trade, watch how coffee futures are going to explode higher tomorrow. That's how it works. What about metals? The dollar is down. Metals shooting up higher across the board, be it gold, silver, platinum, copper, palladium. Copper gave us a little bit of a scare yesterday because it traded down, but today was up again scoring gains of about a little over 1.5%. When it comes to meats, flattish across the board for live and feeder cattle futures. On the other hand, lean hogs, down about 2% for the day. When it comes to grains, down across the board for the most part, led by wheat, corn, soybean oil, canola, oats, all down. Yet we have some notable gains here for rough rice, closing with gains of about 3 quarters of a percent for the day. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? Now, I'm not sure if this is a mistake or not, but I see a lot of put options buying here. 
The ratios are insane. And at number one, Amazon, with around 2 million contracts traded today, about 71% of those were puts, not calls. What's going on here? Tesla, the souffle, number two, with around 1.6 million contracts traded today, about 58% of those were puts, not calls. And then at number three, Apple, with around 1.2 million contracts traded today, about 57.5% of those were calls. But again, Meta, 80% of the spread for puts, not calls. Alibaba, over 90% puts. Something is going on here. In the meantime, moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. And we start with the ticker USO. This is the oil fund, basically betting for oil prices to move higher. And somebody sees a rebound coming from today's declines, and they bought the 82 call for the expiration date, December 16, with the expectations that the name could move higher and score gains of more than 10% by then. They paid around one buck and 65 cents apiece. Tanner, this trade, all in all, spending around 1.65 million dollars what about the spy we have somebody fading uh, the rip or the uh, dead cat bounce and they bought the 340 puts for the expiration date december 7 with the expectations that the spi spy could move down and lose more than 11 percent of its value by then they paid around one buck a piece standard this trade all in all spending around one million dollars and then what about the ticker c-a-r-g car gurus is that it car gurus yep the name is at all-time lows right now, and somebody sees more pain to come. Maybe bankruptcy. They bought the 13 bucks puts for the expiration date, November 18, with the expectations that the name could move down and lose more than 5.5% of its value by then. They paid around one buck a piece, Stanner, this trade all in all, spending around $800,000. And then what about the ticker COIN, Coinbase, down big today, but somebody sees a rebound for some reason here. And they bought the 60 bucks calls for the expiration date, November 18, with the expectations that the name could move higher in a rebound and gain more than 18 percent by then they paid around one buck and 85 cents a piece standard this trade all in all spending around one million dollars on to the heat map what's going on here mostly in the green mostly riding the wave of yields going down of the dollar going down we see chips gaining, we see materials gaining, and we see of course some of the short covering momentum that's happening in Boeing BA. Although that might stop, we'll cover the charts in a minute, but we see the Chinese names down, Alibaba, Tesla, Neo, all down for the day. And let's start by talking about the movers here, because besides the dollar going down, chips moved higher on this. We got the news that NVIDIA is now offering new advanced chips for China, but the catch is they meet U.S. exports controls. I'm not sure that this is going to fly. I think that the main purpose of these restrictions is to choke China, and I don't think the Chinese will accept any other chips besides the ones that they're actually looking for. I don't think they're going to accept these uh, half-assed chips. I don't know. And then here it is, Tesla's down. We got the recall, 40,000 cars, steering wheel, doesn't work pretty good. You drive your souffle in the highway, all of a sudden you want to take the exit, doesn't happen. You're just stuck. You're going to go straight off a cliff. And of course, we got the news after the bill that Reverend Elon Musk is now dumping more shares as we expected in this program. No surprise here. And the dumping will continue. He stuck his foot in his mouth. He's in big trouble right now. And he's going to need billions and billions and billions of dollars. And the piggy bank here is Tesla stock. The question remains, how long will the shareholders take? How much more pain? before they say, okay, Elon has lost it completely. It's not the same guys he used to be before. And you know what? I'm out. If that happens, then we could see more pain for Tesla. And of course, Reverend Elon is a master manipulator. So he's going to come out tomorrow on Twitter and say, hey, uh, did you guys catch me dumping stock? Oh, never mind. This is going to be the last batch. And he said that over and over and over in the past. And he continues to dump. But once he says that, we will see short covering. The stock will go higher until the next dumping happen. And then we have news for AMC, which reported earnings after the bell. But before the bell, the stock went higher by about 2.5% because they have a collaboration with Zoom. They're going to turn the theaters into Zoom rooms, whatever that means. Maybe they can pop the champagne together in celebration of bankruptcy. And then we have Netflix. You see the ads thing causes a lot of short covering, but that's not going to fly. Allowing an ads tier, that's not going to solve Netflix's problems. So now they're thinking about, how about sports? How about uh, we turn Netflix into ESPN or something? How about we buy some rights for uh, tennis? And I say this is silly. This is stupid. They might as well buy the WWE. That would be a better investment for them. And then what about FedEx? You know, FedEx pisses me off because 
A lot of you asked me before, hey, should I short FedEx? Uh, gasoline prices are going higher, wages are going higher, but the economy is about to head into a recession. It makes sense to short FedEx. And I said, no, be careful, it might go higher, because the snakes at the C-suite came out and said, oh, we're going to increase dividends because things are going pretty good. And I thought, why short a stock when they're increasing the dividends, when they're making more cash as they claimed? And then a few weeks later, they came out and say, oh, did we say that we're increasing dividends and everything's hunky-dory? No, it's not. Uh, we're actually shitting our pants here. And of course, FedEx goes down big, and this happens to be a leading indicator to what's about to happen in the economy. And FedEx sees a massive slowdown in demand to the point where they're cutting flights. Not a good sign. Another not a good sign for the economy is Salesforce, now cutting hundreds of employees on Monday. And the hundreds will become thousands. You know the story. And then we have this, uh, this story from Tyson, TSN. And the spoiled brat CFO, well, he got into a fiasco here. John R. Tyson, the chief financial officer for Tyson Foods and great-grandson of the company's founder, is uh, embarrassed, quote-unquote, after being arrested Sunday for public intoxication and criminal trespassing. Wow, should put that in your resume. Tyson, 32, in a memo to the company's first reported by the Associated Press, said the conduct was inconsistent with my personal values, the company's values, and high expectations we hold for... How about you own it, bitch? How about you come out and say, you know what, I'm 32, and yeah, I got drunk, and I trespass on somebody's property, and I was naked. But who didn't do that? And if you didn't, you're missing out in life. Get lost already. Tyson was found asleep Sunday morning in a woman's bed in her home in northwestern Arkansas, according to a report on key NWO folks. Blah, blah, blah. She did not know who he was and called the police. Now, had she knew, maybe she would have blackmailed him. Hey, um, $2 million, what do you say? And I keep my mouth shut. But he was booked early Sunday, according to the Washington County, Arkansas Sheriff's Department. And of course, he was released later that day. Now, if it was uh, any of us, we're not going to be released right away. The CFO says, I made a serious mistake and this has caused me to reflect deeply on the impact of my actions or the impact my actions can have on others. What are you talking about here, dude? You're going to get drunk next weekend. Tyson was elevated to the CFO effective October 2nd. He is the son of the board chairman John H. Tyson and is a fourth generation member of the Tyson family. You see, when you have these spoiled brat kids and you can't raise them, you gotta let the military do the job. Anyways, moving on to the heat map for the ETFs. Mostly green. The majority of the pain is happening in natural gas. You know the story. U-N-G-B-O-I-L down big. The USO for oil. Also down. Oil ETFs were down for the same reason. But the dollar was down. And this is good for materials. The XLB, XME all shooting up higher. GDX, gold miner, up about 6% for the day. SLV for silver shooting up higher. But the demise of the dollar is also good. Well, it's not really demise. It's just a pullback. But anyways, it's good for chips. Chips also surging higher. SMH, SOXX, all surging higher today. When the dollar goes down, it's also good for international markets. The majority in the green, with the exception of China. A little pullback after massive gains. And my hunch, the pullback will continue. Because these uh, liftoff of the lockdowns, that's not going to happen. In the meantime, moving on to the charts. And we begin with SPY, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? Yesterday, I talked about how... The midterms optimism could get us all the way to 385.15. And exactly, we got there. But I also reminded the viewers that the bears would argue that this is a larger bear flag pattern. And it remains the case for now. What do you know? The chart went all the way to 385.15. It stopped there. And now what do we see? A pullback, then a rebound from 397.5. But it doesn't look that the chart is going to make it above 385.15 again. It looks as it's going to go down in a retest to 379.5. You can guess that this will be the outcome because look at the RSI. It is in negative divergence. The rebound came weaker with very little volume and the trend remains down. When we look at the daily chart for the continuous contract, the SPY, again, a reflex, a rebound of the support of 3,720.5. But now the chart faces the resistance, and it's going to be a stiff one, at 3,855. And yesterday, I talked about this scenario, that this could be a reverse ABC pattern. We got the A leg. Now we're forming the B leg, which is supposed to be done right now and by tomorrow. 
we start forming the sea leg, which will take us all the way down to 3600. Now, this is not a definitive conclusion because we don't have a crossing in the MACD indicator giving us the confirmation. The volume is not moving higher, so we're still waiting for confirmation here. But so far, it looks like the reverse ABC will take place. When we look at the NASDAQ, the Q's 30 minutes chart, again, we talked about the same thing that was going on in the SPY. The midterms optimism by the rumor, sell the news, will get us all the way to the June bottom, 269.29. But the larger pattern remains a bear flag pattern. What do you know? We got above the June bottom again, but immediately the Q's reversed, went down, and it doesn't look like it's going to make it above the uh, June bottom, 269.29 again. If anything, it looks like a reverse ABC pattern, which will take us all the way down to 261.69 again. And you can see clearly the negative divergence on the RSI, all indicators are saying down we go. And here's the continuous contract for the Qs, a daily chart. Once again, it is in a reflex rebound to the June bottom at around 11,058 and a half. But we also talked about we have a confirmation here, unlike the SPY. Look at the MACD showing red impressions in the histogram. The volume is moving higher. The RSI is in negative divergence again. And we talked about what if this is a reverse ABC pattern, which will take us all the way in a retest to the lows, at least. And it appears for now that this is the scenario taking place. The IWM, believe it or not, 30 minutes chart, it was the lagger today. Now, I've been saying all of this talk about the IWM leading the Qs and the SPY bullshit. I think the IWM is going to follow the lead of the Qs to the downside. It didn't even go all the way to 183.25 today. It remains in a bearish, flaggish kind of consolidation for now, which means down we go in a retest of 174.22. But the most important chart, if it continues to go down, market goes higher, the dollar index. It lost an important support today of 110. It is back in negative divergence on the RSI. It remains in negative momentum in the MACD indicator. But most importantly, when we clean up the chart and we switch to a line chart, we can see that the chart now forming lower highs, and lower lows, a negative trend. But we have a line of support here. So will the dollar rebound from this line of support? If it does, equities will go down. But equities bulls might take comfort in the action from gold. Gold is shooting up higher. It is now above 1,685. We know that gold is conservative. It's not going to rally without a confirmation that the dollar is going down. But the question becomes, we're not negating the negative trend in the dollar. We're not questioning the pop in gold. All what we're saying right now is, could it be a pullback in gold? Could we see that? Maybe an A, B, C pattern, a retracement to 1,671 and then a pop higher again. And that means a rebound in the dollar. Maybe it goes down after that again. Something to think about. Now, here's a daily chart for Brent Oil. The A, B, C remains intact for now. But the chart is facing the resistance at around 98. We got the bad news from the EIA. I don't believe them, but it doesn't matter. It's going to impact the commodity negatively. I look at the tailwinds. I look at the action in the dollar, and I see crude going higher. But we have to play the devil's advocate here. What if it doesn't make it above 98? What if this is a double top? And down we go, all the way back to 85. Entirely possible. And we're going to know that perhaps by the end of the week. Here's the daily chart for the 10-year yield. Remember, this remains in negative divergence on the RSI and the MACD. And it went all the way in a retest of the resistance, as I pointed out. But market bulls would argue, look, this could be a bear flag consolidation pattern. Yes, the chart rebounded higher. But it did not make a higher high. And it is doing so based on weak momentum. Look at the RSI, look at the MACD. Sooner or later, this chart goes down. And if it does, this will be good for utilities, REITs, home builders, technology. But it's too soon to say that because we could fall into the classic mistake of relying entirely on the technicals and ignoring the fundamentals. We have an important fundamental catalyst, the CPI. If that comes out hot, yields will shoot up higher and the technicals are not going to matter. Let's move on to the VIX, four hours chart. And let's go back to what I said yesterday and then come back and see what's going on. But for now, the assumption is we should get a rebound from 24.29. Now, can you get it right away with midterm optimism? Kind of hard to see. Can you get it after that if the CPI comes out too hot? Yes, you can. But the key would be, can the VIX keep 24.29 as support even with midterm optimism? For me, that would be a leading indicator that the VIX is about to pop. 
Here it is. Despite the initial rally in equities in the morning, the VIX rallied higher, and it is holding on the support of 24.29, which means relative strength, which happens to be a leading indicator that the VIX is ready to go higher. You put two and two together, SPY will go down, be it because we have buy the rumor, sell the news, read the elections, maybe a negative outcome, maybe the Democrats are going to win, maybe the CPI will come out disappointing, whatever the reason is. The technicals, the setup says VIX will shoot up higher. And it's going to aim at 33. And equities bulls must be careful here, not to feel too indulged in buying the dips and assuming that the stock market is going higher until we see the VIX losing 24.29 support. And since I forgot to do the TLT, here it is, the TLT, a daily chart on track, the reverse ABC could get us all the way down to 87.94. So if you're looking at the 10-year and you say, okay, it's going to go down, be careful here because the TLT, at least for now, shows that we're going to see lower lows. Not a definitive conclusion yet, but this is where it's heading right now. And then what about Apple? 15 minutes chart. Yesterday, we talked about this. Take a look. But are we seeing, at least from a 30 minutes perspective, a cup and handle formation? If that is the case, then we could see Apple rallying higher. And if Apple rallies higher, along with the dollar going down, now we no longer have opposite dilemmas and the market will shoot up higher big time. But so long as the dilemma is intact, you're going to see a cap on the rally. You can be excited about the dollar going down, but you can't be excited about Apple underperforming. Now here's the problem for Apple. The rebound was merited because 134.37 is strong support. The chart rebounded from that point before, but again, it has stiff resistance at the reversal candle at around let's say 142 even if we have a rally all the way to 142 the likelihood is the rally will stall and then fail again and whether it is a higher high a cup and handle doesn't matter what it is the name moved higher not all the way to my target but it pulled back again and it lost the support of 138.79 the rescue operation by the end got us above it but when we zoom in what do we see here from a 15 minutes chart is this the beginning of a head and shoulder formation? And if it is, the chart loses the support of 138.79, and down we go back to 134.37. And then the souffle, and I tweeted this for Tesla, I said the souffle is struggling to close the gap. Failure to do so indicates lack of energy, and the chart will have to go down to seek support below. 180 is the next decent support. And this was a 3 minutes chart, so let's move in. To the 30 minutes chart and see what's going on the gap is not filled yes we have a higher high for now but we could also look at it as another bear flag consolidation pattern and if it is sooner or later down we go to 180 is it oversold right now the answer is not really but if it goes down to 180 fast it's gonna be oversold and we could see a decent rebound from that point on here's another one microsoft i tweeted this i said microsoft stops at the resistance likely to lose momentum this was a 15 minutes chart so let's go in and see what's going on in the 30 this time around we can see the chart stopping at the resistance exactly and then pulling back the RSI is in negative divergence so what i see here is a reverse abc pattern microsoft goes all the way down to the Fibonacci support at around 215. And next, let's do updates for some of the charts that i talked about in the past we start with netflix here we go a daily chart for the name. For now, it is overbought on the RSI, the MACD. It is holding onto the support of 290. But the likelihood is, if the Fed comes out hawkish, the dollar pops higher. This is one of the most sensitive names to the US dollar. We covered the earnings and we found out that the company is losing tremendous growth based on the currency impact alone. So if that is the case, the chart goes down to close the gap at 250. That would be an excellent trade. But rest assured, if you happen to be bullish Netflix, Nothing will change here because even if it goes down to close this gap, who's to say that the name is not going to rebound higher in an ABC pattern? And here's the update. The name is down all the way, not quite to 250, not quite to closing the gap. But is it close enough? Is it close enough to form the C leg all the way to the upside? Too early to say. I think tomorrow is going to be a decisive day. If the chart goes down to 250, it doesn't rebound from that point on. Then down we go all the way to 231.32. But if it does rebound, or if it scores more gains and it moves its way higher, then in all likelihood it's not going to visit 250 exactly, and it's ready to form the C leg all the way higher. For now, if you bought puts and you scored gains, what is the harm in taking some chips off the table? And maybe, if you want to ride it all the way down, you do so by the house money.
not by yours. And here's another call I made yesterday on Disney, not as good as this one. Take a look. The name is about to report earnings, I believe, tomorrow. What we see in the chart is a double bottom formation. It is facing some resistance here. And this is a weekly chart, by the way. And the question is, can it rally based on the double bottom, based on earnings? and retrace some of the move to the downside that it got so far, that is entirely possible. And I think Disney will have a positive reaction here. And here's the update. Disney reported earnings after the bell, and the name is down big. Down about 7% last time I checked. So this is a bad call. Again, the technicals look good, but the fundamentals are awful. I looked at the report. Not a good report. It appears that the streaming business, Disney Plus, is actually a liability, not an asset because they're not able to monetize the platform. They need to charge more. The problem with charging more is you're going to lose subscribers. Big problem for Disney, and the likelihood is the name goes all the way down to retest the 2020 lows. Unbelievable. And then we have the ticker BA Boeing. This is a daily chart. The name ran in an impulsive rally since October. It used to trade at around 125. Now it's trading at around 170. At some point, this pop is going to run out of gas. And my hunch is the resistance at around 173.85 will put a stop to this pop higher, if not even before reaching this number. It is getting overbought in the RSI, so we know that we have a pullback imminent right now. And the trick here is, if you want to bet to the downside, you buy puts on increments. So I bought today, if it goes up to 173.85 and then reverse, and we have a clear reversal, I add batch number two to the trade. And even if it goes down right away and I have a confirmation, I'll add more. And the likelihood is if we have a severe pullback, it stops at around 149, 150-ish. And lastly, tulips, Bitcoin, four hours chart. What's going on here? Look at this. Oh boy. Initially, the chart lost the trend line in yellow, but it caught support from 20,000, the most important support. And it managed to recapture the trend line and it made a higher high. So far, so good. Then came the retest of the trend line. That was met with failure. Then came the flush down and the loss of 20,000. Then the reflex, the retouch of the trend line. That was negative, and the chart went all the way down. You see that candle? It went all the way down, and it closed below 20,000 back in the consolidation box. Now, this is a reversal a clear one, and this is a bad development for Bitcoin. Now, we could see a rebound from oversold conditions, as you can see in the RSI, but in all likelihood, it's going to fail to get us all the way above 20,000 again. Wait for the rebound, if it happens to begin with, and then you can short all the way down to 15,000. And lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have wholesale inventories. This is a revision, not a big deal here. But we have more Fed zombies speaking, Williams from New York and Tom Barkin from Richmond. And with that, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Take care. Let me give you some advice. Stay away from this guy, huh? Give him a wide berth. He's what is called a born loser. A real monster. <laughs>